Hi, and welcome to Wealthy On. My name is James Conner, and today my guest is Professor Steve Henke, and Steve is a professor of applied economics at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Steve has done much research on the money supply and its impact on inflation and also economic growth. And by studying the money supply, it can help us determine where the economy is going and also where the asset prices are going. Hi, Steve. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Baltimore? Things are a little bit gloomy, cloudy down here kind of chilly, but great to be with you. Thank you. It's pretty well the same thing in Toronto. I, I don't think I've seen the sun in about six weeks, maybe longer. Yeah, well, we had, the, fortunately, we had the sun yesterday, but. Steve, before we do the deep dive on the economy, there's a lot happening in the world right now, both politically and economically. And when we examine all of these events, I want to get your thoughts. Are, are there any specific things that really concern you or anything that keeps you up at night? Well, we, we got two hot wars going, one in Ukraine and, and, and one in, uh, in Gaza. And, that, and, and the one in Gaza, it keeps escalating and, and expanding. The idea that it's not a regional conflict is a joke. It, it is a regional conflict. So, so you have a lot going on because you not only have Gaza, you've got Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, the Red Sea, Suez Canal, you know what? What more? I mean, it, it, it's it's a big deal, and 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 dangerous. And it sounds like you're concerned about expansion or expanding beyond the current countries that the war is happening in. Yes, it it keeps escalating every day, and the, the narrative we've been given, you know, the the propaganda coming out of the Grand Wurlitzer is that. It's, it's it's very contained, very well managed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, don't, don't worry, relax. That's, that's not the way I see it. Well, Steve, I want to talk about the economy now. And you and your partner, John Greenwood, you've done a lot of research on the money supply and also the quantity theory of money. And I want to start right here. It's been a while since I was sitting in econ class, so I want you to give me a refresher and just provide me with a basic overview of the money supply, what it is, how it's calculated, and also how it pertains to the quantity theory of money. Well, you, uh, James, you can define it several ways, uh, but uh, and, and broadly or narrowly, and 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 broadly, uh, you you include obviously currency notes and coins that are in circulation. That's a small part of the picture. The the big chunk of the the money supply. When once you start measuring it broadly, let's say that. The, the number M2 signifies the broadest measure that the Federal Reserve uses in the United States. And, and that roughly, uh, if you deposits in the banking system make up, uh, I'd say about 75% of M2. I don't have it right in front of me, but it, the, the, big, the big bulk of money is really not produced by the central banks, it's produced by the commercial banks. So, so the, the, the best way to get a handle on it is think of deposits in banks or th things that are close to being liquid deposits, you know, de deposits in money market funds, uh, that, that counts in the money supply. So thing, things that you can use to make transactions with, and you can use currency, of course, and you, you can use your checking account and and for money market accounts, you, you, a lot of those are associated with a debit card. So you can use a debit card and draw down your money market funds very quickly for instant transactions or, or pretty close to it. You can always just withdraw and deposit money market funds into a checking account, write a check. But so, so at any rate, that's the, the main thing. The, 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 the big part of it and the elephant in the room really is, is the commercial banking system. That's, that's where most of the money comes from. When they make a loan to you, what happens? They top up your checking account and, 
and and you can spend it. It's money. So and and the best way to think about it too, from an economic point of view, is broadly measured. The more broadly the measure of money, the better, and that indicates the amount of so-called money that is is in the hands of the non-bank public, you and me. We're, we're not banks, but how much money do we have available to spend? And, and the reason for that is that that is really the fuel that fuels the economy. That broad money, however, whether it's M2 or in some countries, it gets out to M3, a little broader measure, including a few other things. Uh, those broad measures are relevant because that is fuel that makes the economy go around. And we really want to be looking if we use, you mentioned the quantity theory of money, if we then look at the quantity theory of money, that theory is really a theory of national income determination that's driven by, by, by money. And when I say national income determination, that means what? It means nominal GDP. And nominal GDP has two components. Uh, one is inflation, and the other is real economic activity. So if, if inflation is now, you know, about 3% in the United States, a little more than 3%, and if we're growing at 3%, that, that means that no, nominal 3 plus 3 equals 6. The nominal GDP is moving along at about 6%. Of course, some, some countries, uh, we, we've got inflation over a thousand percent per year in Zimbabwe. So the, so even if the real growth in the economy is zero or negative, the nominal GDP would be over a thousand percent. And 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 the quantity theory of money helps get a handle on what that nominal GDP is. And and. And the formula is the equation of exchange, really, and that, that is MV, money, whatever that broad measure is, times velocity, equals P, the price level, times Y, the real rate of growth in the economy. So on the right-hand side of that identity, the PY, the P is inflation, and the Y is real economic growth. So at any rate, and in short, that's, that's it, money. Money moves things. Inflation is always and everywhere caused by changes in the money supply using the quantity theory of money, which is very reliable as, as a guide to the course where nominal national income or nominal GDP is going in the economy. And, and by the way, you, uh, John Greenwood and I, using this quantity theory of the money, we we, we've hit the ups and downs in this inflation cycle almost perfectly in the United States. We said that we we had a forecast. We said inflation might go up to as high as 9%. It actually went up to 9.1% in June of 2022. And then, and then we said it would end last year, in December of last year, it would end between 2 and 5%. It ended at 3.4%, the headlines consumer price index. So, so where is it going now? We think given what's going on with the money supply and unprecedented contraction of the money supply in the United States, that next year we could, we could end up at 2% or below by the end of the year. I, I shouldn't say next year. <laughs> it's this year, 2024. And so if I want to clarify or just summarize a lot of what you just said, money and the components of the money supply are the fuel that drive the economy. The more money in the system, the more robust the economy is, and the less the less money in the system, the less robust it is. Do I have uh, that right? Well, yeah, but we have to be careful when we say robust economy, that, that's robust, the nominal economy that's made... We prices plus the real component of the economy. So usually when people talk about the, how robust an economy is, they talk about just the, they're talking about real economic growth adjusted for inflation, taking inflation away. So if, if something was robust, they have high real rates of growth, maybe 
you know, and you're up there in Canada, or it's like the United States, a, a real rate of growth of 3% is pretty good. I mean, the potential, the long-term sustained potential in the United States is down closer to 2%. So if, it, if it's growing at 3%, that's, we could say that's very robust in the United States for real economic growth without inflation in the picture. And then when we get a change or a large change in the money supply, we also get a corresponding change in asset prices. Is that correct? Yes. You, usually with, within about six months, uh, you know, that the, there's a transmission mechanism. You, you, you have sustained changes in the money supply. And, and then with a lag, you get changes first in asset prices. And so in this last inflation in the United States, wh what happened? Well, real, real estate went boom, booming up. The stock market went booming up. Th those, those are asset prices. And, and, and hard assets, even, even during, during that boom, you had things like used car prices went, went through the roof. Uh, and those are asset prices. And then the next thing that happens with, with a, a longer lag, usually about six to 18 months, is that the real economy, that Y component in the MV equals PY identity, that starts changing. And then even with a longer lag, you get changes in prices, the, 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 the P part of the equation of exchange, inflation. And, and it's always and everywhere inflation, a function of what's happening let's say a year ago or two years ago with the money supply and a great book written in the 70s about uh, eggflation was written by uh, Gottfried Hobbler and Hobbler investigated the scene and, and said that he found no place where there was sustained inflation in the world of four percent or more for two years or more in which you hadn't had prior to that sustained increases in the money supply, excess money being produced, basically. Interesting points. And can you take us through other points in history when we've had this contraction in money supply and what the result was or how the economy responded to that? Okay, if we now we're contracting, we, we, we were going up and, and, and by the way, the, the money supply, when it went up in the United States, it, it, it was unprecedented. It, it peaked out. Uh, the growth year over year was about a little over 27%. Now, to be consistent with the Federal Reserve's inflation target at 2% per year, the money supply measured by M2, that thing that I was talking about earlier, it, it should be growing at about 6%. That's Han Hankey's golden growth rate for the money supply that in the U.S. that's consistent with hitting a 2% inflation target. So it's about 6% per year. It was growing at 27%. So, of course, there was a lot of excess money. That difference between 6% and 27%, it was huge. And that excess money buildup filtered through into asset prices, the economy got goosed then, and, and then we had a, a, this inflation pop. Now we're contracting at, at a near unprecedented rate uh, since March of 2022, the money supply has actually contracted by four and a half percent. And we haven't seen a contraction that big since the period 1929 to 1933, and you, you know what happened then. We had something called the Great Depression followed that contraction. We've, we've actually had only four times in which the money supply has ever contracted in the United States, and they've all been followed by recessions. So that's why Greenwood and I believe that a recession is baked in the cake because we've had this contraction and, and with a long and variable lag, we, we eventually will get a recession. Now, John and I originally thought that 
this would occur in late 2023. Well, it, it didn't occur then. And, and then we, we, we moved it out a little, a, little, a quarter or two. And as we watch the data, we've, we've now moved it out towards the end of, of this year, 2024. So you say, well, how can that be? You know, and, and, and it's e easy because the money supply changes, but, but you have typical lag of six months to 18 months. And, and sometimes, by the way, the lag can be up to three years. So, so it's very hard to pinpoint exactly when the recession is going to hit when you've had a contraction. The only thing we know is that we're, whenever we have had four times contraction in the money supply in the United States, it's always been followed by a recession. So that's why I'm confident that we have one that's baked in the cake. The cake was baked already a, a year ago, a year and a half ago. And Steve, when you said it could be up to a three-year leg, is that from the peak or the trough? Well, that 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 would be uh, again. It, it's 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 an art to. It, this would be from the from the end of the sustained increase in the money supply. So me, measuring. It, Define the period where you have the sustained money supply, and and at the end of that period, start counting, and you've got you know, er, an early arrival would be at the six month uh, period, and and a, a late arrival would be at the eighteen month period. But that 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 now we're on the late later side, and and the reason, by the way, we changed our mind. The facts changed, and and. Uh, to John Maynard Keynes, when the facts change, I change my mind. And, and then Keynes said, and what would you do, sir? <laughs> the facts, what facts changed? That huge buildup and excess money didn't drain off and wasn't spent as fast as we originally had thought it would. We, we, we looked at kind of typical, shall we say, drain rates and and, and thought that we'd be on the early side of that six to 18 month lag. Well, it didn't work out that way. The, the drain was slower than typical. And that's why we have the facts have changed. We've changed our minds. What would you do, sir? And just so I understand you, the, you're suggesting that because the money supply is contracting, there's not people can't borrow money to buy houses or to buy cars and corporations or businesses can't borrow money to expand their business. Yeah. It, it's not, well, I'm not, they, the, the loan, the loan, loan component at commercial banks is actually negative year over year at about 1%. The level of loans has actually gone down in, over the last year. So I'm not saying you can't, not, People are, are getting loans, but, but the total amount that's being emitted in loans is, is a little less than it was a year ago. So, so in fact, things are fairly tight in a credit market sense or a loan, getting down to the practicalities of, of getting, getting a loan. Uh, you know, the, the, the system isn't awash with loans like, like it was at one point. It was it was awash with loans, by the way, right after COVID. Remember, that's one reason that the money supply went shooting up after COVID in February of, of 2020. First, the Fed, they they were pumping. So the Federal Reserve was adding to the money supply M2. But also all corporations and individuals who had credit lines at banks got got were scared and and, and they they drew down those credit lines now when they did that and received loans what happened their checking accounts went up and and that means m2 the money supply went up so you had both both engines a commercial bank engine with loans going up and the fed purchasing treasury 
bonds and bills from the non-bank public. And when the, when the, when the Fed is buying those bills and bonds from the non-bank public, what do they do? They, they credit your checking account. If they're, if they're buying, if they're buying something from Hanky or Connor, we're giving them a treasury bill or a bond and, and they're putting money in our checking account. And, and once that happens, the checking account is part of the money supply. You mentioned earlier that the contraction that we are experiencing right now is on par with what we saw back in 1929. And do you think, or are you well, suggesting- Well, it's, it's, not, it's not quite, it's not as great as 1929, 1933. You have to go back to that point to find one that that's 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 as big as we have experienced March 2022 to now negative 4.5 percent the contraction was bigger over that 29 33 period but but the there there were two little contractions prior to 29 33 but they were smaller than the 4.5 percent so that's why i went all the way back to 29 33 and so what's going to be the end result if we have such a severe contraction in the money supply well i mean the the, the We'll continue to see a, a, a disinflation in the economy. With the you, you you can forget about inflation going up; it's going down. And I think if it's if it's now running at three point four percent year over year, Greenwood and I think by the end by the end of this year, we'll be down to two percent or something, a little bit below two percent. That's that's on the inflation part. That's part of the nominal income. Remember, the nominal income is inflation plus real growth. So what, what about real growth? Well, real growth, we think by the end of the year, we'll probably be in a recession. It, it'll, be, it'll, it'll be a negative number. We've seen a lot of layoffs here in the last few months. UPS recently announced they were laying off 12,000 people. Citibank or Citigroup also announced they were laying off 20,000. Many other firms, Google, Spotify, many more have announced massive layoffs. Do you think this is an indication of a slowdown in the economy? Well, the, the, yes, but you, you have to be a little bit careful. The, the, the overall, the unemployment rate is still pretty low and the, the job market generally, generally is looks pretty good at shall we say 30,000 feet, but once you start drilling down and looking at what's going on very carefully, there's, there's a lot of weakness showing up. And as, you, as you've indicated, some of these big headline layoffs, uh, like the UPS thing, uh, they, they just came up with the labor deal, you know, not too long ago, and now they're laying off a, a lot of workers. But that's consistent with revisions that they've done in employment the last few months, the revisions have all been down, not, not up. So when the, they, they originally announce a number and then a month or so later, they revise the number, but the revisions have all been down, suggesting, you know, weaknesses. And, and if you look at the overall picture, a, a lot of the employment has actually been the increase in government employment, not not in the private sector. So, so that's that's not a particular sign of strength. you the the economy is isn't the government. The economy really is the private sector. And that's a very good point. And one other thing that UPS said was that they are encouraging people to go back to work. And with all these layoffs that we've seen in the last few months or in the past year. Do you think it's a way for companies to purge those who are wor working remotely or they don't want to go back to the office? They're starting to to, to monitor this more carefully because uh, uh, there's at least some speculation that the stay-at-home types uh, you know, engage in a lot of, uh, you know, Shall we say non-work activities while they're home <laughs> rather than working? So, so there's start require more on-site and and uh, you look at the big accounting firms. They've just announced some of them that they're 
you know, you've got an electronic swipe card where you go to the desk, you've got to, you got to swipe in, you know, to make certain that you're there. Hit the time clock. You know, in the old days, you had a punch clock. If you were on an hourly basis, you'd, you'd punch in, you know, and record your time. And, and, and it's, it's a little bit like that. Just did you show up at the office and, the, and, and now they, they can do this with, uh, you know, e e easily with plastic monitoring cards, that kind of thing. So th there is, there is a, a move in that regard, but the, the one thing with labor that's important, it, 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 it's a real lagging indicator in terms of economic activity because the, the last thing a, a company wants to do is, is fire somebody. And, and why is that? If you hire somebody, you train them. You, you invest a lot in human capital and training them. And, and you don't want to you don't want to let people go. The, the idea that a capitalist in, in some way is antagonistic to labor, it, it's kind of a ridiculous idea. Be, if, if I'm a businessman, I, 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 I want my labor force to be happy, you know, and, and, and I. And, and I want to train them. I, I want to increase their human capital so that they're what? So that they're what? So they're more effective, more productive, basically more profitable. Uh, and if they're more productive, I, I, don't, I don't even have a problem with paying them more because they're producing more. So, so the, the last thing, what, what happens is the economy starts slowing down. You, you have much much less overtime pay. So overtime pay starts going down. And, and, and then maybe to keep somebody on the job, may, maybe you would say, look, I, I, I don't want to let you go, but I, I really can't keep you on full time. So we're going to have to go down to some, you know, reduce, reduce even below the normal working hours. And then at the end, if you still can't make it and times are tough, you're, you're going to have to start letting them go. But but get the lag thing. If you're watching the labor market as an indicator, that's going to be one of the last things to go, not, not one of the first things. P people don't fire employees because they anticipate an, a, a recession. They, 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 they let them go when they're deeply in, in in, in the red and in, in the middle of a recession. So Steve, let me just summarize a few of the points you made just so I understand you. We have uh, the money supply peaked in 2022. Since then, it's been falling off and we've had, we have a con contraction now, which means the economy is slowing down. But yet when I look at the economy, the GDP, it's still growing at a, a solid, I believe 5% annualized. We already talked about the jobless rate. It's still pretty low right now. CPI has come down from a high of 9% down to, I believe, around 4%. This S&P and the NASDAQ are doing extremely well, up 20% in 2023. The NASDAQ was up, I believe, close to 40%. And when you look at all of that, like that would indicate to me that things are looking pretty good. Oh, I, I think you're right. I, I think that, I, I think if you, if, if, if you, are data dependent and looking at data today, what's happening today, it, it, it all looks pretty good. The problem is that there are long and variable lags between changes in the money supply and changes in economic activity, changes in asset prices, changes in inflation. And, and, and those lags, as we went over before, we're talking about you know, a, a year, a year and a half, two years. So, so what you're seeing now is driven and 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 the, and been caused by changes in the money supply that have happened a long time ago that, that people don't don't even pay any attention to. So, if they were paying attention to that, as we're as we're talking now, they would say it look it looks pretty good now, but we got we got a storm brewing. We we. We got problems coming down the down the road, and and we know that these problems are are very highly likely to occur 
because we've had this big contraction in the money supply. And, and if we look at the United States, we've only had four times since the founding of the Federal Reserve in 1913 that, that we've actually had contractions in the money supply before. And all of them were followed by recessions. As we would expect, if, if model for national income determination, which I think is the best one, happens to be the quantity theory of money. It's, it's all about money. It's all about the, the economy's fuel. You got, you got too much fuel, you got inflation. You got too little fuel, you're going to slow down and, and have disinflation and, and maybe even a recession. Money makes the world go round. Money makes the world go around. Absolutely. And, and, and by the way, James, it, it's, a, it's a fairly commonsensical thing, actually. You, you don't really have to take Economics 101 to get it. Of course, the way they teach Economics 101 today, you, you might not get it in that course, but you would if you were taking it from me. I might have to come and sit in on one of your classes. Well, well, you're absolutely welcome to do so. You you could give a little guest lecture. That would be good. Give it. Give, give the students a little rundown on mining in Canada. By all means. By all means. Steve, a lot of the move we've seen in the S and P and the Nasdaq here in recent months is all predicated on the expectation of lower interest rates. And I want to get your thoughts on this. Um, do you think the Fed is going to start cutting here in the first or second quarter? Or and, and I also want to know if you think the Fed is ahead of the curve or behind the curve? Well, the, the Fed really doesn't know where the curve is because they don't look at the money supply. It's all about the money supply. Monetary policy, as Milton Friedman once said, is, is not about interest rates. It's about changes in the money supply. So, so the Fed... Is, is really flying blind in the sense that they're, they're not looking at the money supply. It would be like flying an airplane and, and just having nothing on the altimeter. It should, the money supply should be on the altimeter, but they're not looking at it. So, so that's one point. The, the second point is that the Fed is, is data dependent and they look at things like the financial conditions indices. What's, what's happening today with interest rates, interest rate spreads, in, inflation, uh, unemployment, uh, labor force participation, all, all these current things. And all those things are lagging indicators. They lag behind what's been going on with the money supply. So in, in that sense, they're, they're behind the curve because they're looking at lagging indicators. And, and once, for example, the recession, the economy really starts slowing down. I think the Fed will pivot. And, and when the Fed pivots, they, they usually pivot big. So, so, so we can anticipate that the, the one thing that they utilize in terms of what they think is important, money supply is the federal funds rate, the interest rate. And it doesn't look like the market thinks that they're going to lower it much until the second half of the year. That, that's, that's what the markets think right now. And uh, if the recession occurs in the second half of the year, uh, believe me, they, they, they will pivot and, and they, they might come in with bigger incre uh, decreases in the federal funds rate than the market expects right now. The market's expecting federal funds rates to come down, but they, they, they kind of have it coming later, not, not these next two meetings of the Fed, but may, maybe, maybe in May, maybe the May meeting. And when you say the Fed's going to pivot and it could pivot big, do you think that'll be an indication because they see things now that are maybe what you're talking about, but things are looking pretty severe? I, th I think I think it will come in the labor market. If the labor market starts really looking sour, I, I think the Fed will pivot. And how do you think the financial markets will react to that? Well, you got two forces going. On the one hand, interest rates are coming down, and and you know just using a simple discounted cash flow 
model. If you're discounting cash flow at a lower interest rate, the present value is higher. So that 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 boosts stocks valuations. But if you if if you're going into recession and earnings are going down, that 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 is that that is a, a negative in that free cash flow model. The free cash flow isn't flowing as as, as strongly as it was before a recession. And so you're discounting less cash flow and that's a negative. I, I happen to think on balance, if we run into a recession, I think the PE ratios are pretty high in the stock market right now. They're very high actually. I think they'll come down. I think the valuations will come down. So I think the PE ratios will come down and, and earnings will be lower. So that means that it, what? It means it's, it means this, the stock market could be in for a spill. And when we take all of this into consideration, how do we protect ourselves? How do we protect our wealth? Well, that's 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 a that's a tricky question. The one, the the one thing this is this is on the safe side. This we're not talking really about speculative assets so much. But if you look, the. the Probably the most important interest rate, if you were to just pick one in the United States, would be the yield on the ten-year bond, and and that that yield's pretty high right now. I, I haven't actually looked this morning; it's, it's just a little over four uh, percent, which is which is high. And if we look ahead, we know Greenwood and I think inflation's coming down. And if inflation comes down, yields come down. So that would suggest that the yield, which will be driven by lower inflation and a slowing economy, will come down on the 10-year. And, and that means what? You would, you would want to be, from a trade anyway, long the 10-year. Because if the yields come down, the price of the 10-year will go up. So if if you were long now, you 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 know, and 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 held a thing to maturity, you'd be getting what a little over four percent. If you were just trading it, which would be the position I would take, you would you would want to be buying the ten year and uh, anticipating a capital gain on that, selling it at some point for a trade. But but. In the meantime, you've got you've got a safe asset, and the safe assets are going going to be a you're getting paid a little something to hold it, and and you've got a pretty good chance of getting a capital gain, a nice capital gain. So don't put your money into Bitcoin. Well, no, no, no I said that, that that's a speculative asset, not not a. You, you said how would you protect your and and. Bitcoin is highly speculative. That, that's a little bit like going to Las Vegas. If you if you like to go to Vegas, that's that's fine. But if if you're not inclined to to go to the roulette wheel, uh, I, I would stay away from Bitcoin. Gold is another thing, by the way, that it usually does quite well in recessions, and it's it's been quite steady recently. Gold uh, has, and I I happen to be. Uh, you know, positive on gold because I, I see I, I anticipate a recession coming. Gold does pretty well in recession, so gold would be another thing like the ten year. You, you asked the question, Jamie. You said, "Well, how do you protect yourself?" So, so the main thing you don't want to lose capital, and that's why Bitcoin is a speculative asset with no f fundamental value and. If you want to protect your assets, that's that's not where you want to be. If you want to speculate, yeah, that's a little that's fine. By the way, the studies that have been done, and Public Morningstar did one study about a year ago. If you even if you put a tiny bit of Bitcoin in your portfolio, one or two percent, you you increase the risk of that portfolio tremendously. It it, it has a very big multiple effect. So if you if you want to make your portfolio a lot more risky than it is, put one or two percent of it into Bitcoin. 
Steve, most of our discussion so far has been focused on the U.S., but you've done a lot of work on currency reform for various other countries, including Argentina. And so you're well acquainted with this country. And it's a beautiful country. It's got a great culture. It's rich in resources, but they can't get it together economically. And according to Bloomberg, inflation was running at over 200% in 2023. It was up 25% in the month of December alone. But I want to get your thoughts on this. What is going on with Argentina and why are they continuously getting into economic trouble? Well, the, the main thing is their central bank. That's that's why they get into economic trouble. So the, the, the new president campaigned on the promise of getting rid of the central bank, getting rid of the peso and putting them both in museums and replacing the peso with the U.S. dollar, what they call dollarization. Now, I've advocated that for a long time. And if, if you have the central bank in Argentina, it's basically like putting a bottle of whiskey next to a, 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 some, somebody who's reco a recovering alcoholic. He's, he's going to grab the bottle eventually and, and get, in, get into trouble. So that's the problem with the central bank. He, even if it was managed temporarily well and not producing excess money, eventually somebody, the politicians will grab for the bottle, they'll produce too much money, the peso will collapse, you'll have a currency crisis, an exchange rate crisis, and, and that's the history of Argentina. So the best way to smash inflation and eliminate the risk of having a currency crisis is to dollarize. And, and, and by the way, the country is de facto dollarized anyway, because you, you can't, everyone saves in dollars. You, they don't save in pesos. So, so the, the, the real currency of the realm is, is the U.S. dollar. If you want to buy anything serious, from an appliance to a car to a house, you have to pay with dollars in Argentina. So the problem is that Malay, the newly elected president, he's put that dollarization plan on the shelf. He, he, he claims that there, his minister of finance, Luis uh, Capito, has said that they're not ready. They're not in a position to dollarize. This is just false. They have enough reserves to dollarize. Uh, in fact, the only reserves that they need to dollarize are gross reserves, and those gross reserves have to be large enough to cover the exchange peso notes that are outstanding with the dollar reserves that they have. And, and that, that ratio of gross foreign reserves to pesos, it's about 2.5 to 1. So they have, they have plenty of pesos to do this. I, I don't think, unfortunately, I think they, they haven't studied the thing properly. They, they really have not indicated that they know what they're doing. And I think inflation will continue and Malay will get into more and more trouble because the public will become fed up with him because he isn't dealing with the main problem that they're facing, inflation. Very interesting points. Well, Steve, I want to thank you very much for making time with us today and sharing your views on both the U.S. economy and also Argentina. And if somebody would like to follow you and, and get your views on what's happening with the economy, where can they go? The easiest way is to follow me on Twitter, and, and, and that is at Steve underscore Hanke, H-A-N-K-E. I'm pretty active. I've got 700,000 followers, uh, and that, that's that's the easiest way. If for some reason you your viewers want to become part of my distribution list, I'll add be happy to add them. They just send me an email at hanky at jhu.edu. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. And I might see you soon in one of your econ classes. Absolutely. You're more than welcome, James. See you in Baltimore. Or who knows, I might get up to Toronto one of these days. See, see my old friends at the Friedberg Mercantile Group, where I'm chairman emeritus.
Oh, very good. I would love to meet you in person. Once again, Steve, thank you. Thank you. Great to be with you. Thanks. Well, I hope you enjoyed that discussion with Professor Steve Henke. One of the things we do at Wealthion is to provide insights from experts like Steve Henke on how to prepare for the future. If you are trying to figure out how to prepare for your financial future, consider having a discussion with a Wealthion endorsed financial advisor at Wealthion.com. There's no obligation to work with any of these advisors. It's a free service that Wealthion offers to all of its viewers. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, Wealthion.com, and also hit that notification button to be kept up to date on future events. We have some amazing content coming out in the coming days and weeks that will help you navigate these financial markets. Once again, thank you very much for spending time with us today, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.